purpose of factoring was so that you could solve the quadratic equations. These are, um, the way that we've been presenting them so far, they've not been equations, they've just been expressions. They haven't been equal to anything. That's what makes it an equation. But we're going to add that piece to it today. And so the whole purpose of factoring is so that we're able to solve these quadratic equations. Now, before we actually get into it, let's look at the possibilities that we can have for a quadratic equation. At this point, I think we all know that a quadratic equation forms a parabola. So we have three scenarios uh, with those parabolas. Either the parabola can cross the x-axis twice. Those two x-intercepts or zeros or solutions or whatever they are called, they can have many, many different names. Looking at the graph, they are x-intercepts but they are solutions to the quadratic equation. Kind of abbreviating here. You may also see the term roots. And I feel like I'm missing it. Zeros. Zeros. Okay. Um, they're also called zeros. Um, what is the ES? What is the ES? That word always messes with me. Zeros. That looks weird too. Anyways. Um, they are also called zeros, and that is the option that you select on your calculator if you can't factor the expression. But this is an example of what we call two real solutions. Two real solutions. Now, there are several different ways that you can come about with that conclusion that you have two real solutions, uh, but the easiest way is to graph it and look. If it crosses the x-axis twice, you have two real solutions. Now, we also have the possibility that our parabola just touches the x-axis. It only touches it right here. That is one real solution. And we call that a repeated root. This is when you have like a perfect square trinomial. Remember how those factored? Those were the ones where we got something like x plus 4 squared. So that answer of negative 4 is repeated. Same answer, but we get it twice. This is what it looks like on the graph. And then the third possibility, I'll actually write that down real quick, sorry. Okay, two real solutions, one real solution. And then the third possibility is that we have no real solution. It is possible that these parabolas may not cross the x-axis at all. We could have, we could have a parabola that looks like this. It never touches the x-axis. We could have one down here. It crosses the y-axis, but it does not cross the x-axis. So this is the case where we have no real solutions. But we have two imaginary or complex Solutions, and we're going to look at those today. We haven't been able, um, we haven't run into these yet, but we will run into them later on today, and we'll talk about that um, in a minute. So it doesn't cross the x-axis ever, so we don't have any real numbers, but we do have what we call imaginary or complex solutions if we don't actually cross the x-axis. Complex solutions always come in pairs. So you'll see in a minute when we start solving these uh, that our 
a real solution, we can have two totally different numbers. We can have negative 7 and positive 2. There's not really any connection between those two numbers. Uh, but when we do have scenarios with imaginary or complex solutions, they're always in pairs. So they'll look exactly the same, they just differ by a sign. One will have a plus, one will have a minus. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. I just want to go ahead and talk to you with that. Okay? Any questions about the different types of solutions that we can get for these quadratic equations? Okay, we're going to start with the first two scenarios. We're going to start with two real solutions and one real solution. Uh, now, I already passed out. Does everybody have a worksheet solving quadratic equations? Okay, our examples are going to come off of that. So we're going to start with number one. Now, our first, oh, yeah. ideally, we would like to be able to solve these quadratics by factoring. But that doesn't always necessarily work out. But this front, front side of the worksheet should uh, always be able to be solved by factoring. Now, the key is, and you should know this now, but I want to remind you, your quadratic equations must be equal to zero before you can start factoring. Okay? Never start factoring these things unless they're equal to zero. And sometimes you have to do a little bit of work to make them equal zero. Now this first one, we don't have to do any work. It's already set up. It is equal to zero. So that means that we can jump right into factoring. This is a simple case of factoring. Uh, our coefficient, our leading coefficient is one. So that doesn't cause us any problems. K times K is the only thing that's going to give us K squared. Uh, 49. 7 times 7 is 49. And 7 plus 7 is 14. For our signs, our last sign is positive. So that means we have the same signs. The first one is negative. So both of those are negative. So notice we ended up with the exact same factors. This is a perfect square trinomial. Okay, this is an example of a perfect square trinomial. So, in order for k minus 7 times k minus 7 to be equal to 0, one or both of those have to be 0. So that's why after this point, we set them equal to 0, and we solve for the variable. Now, obviously, both of these are going to give us the same answer. We add 7 to both sides to get k by itself. So we get that k is equal to 7. Um, so our solution is k equals 7. And I'm just going to put in parentheses here that it is repeated. Uh, it's a repeated root. Okay, so usually we're looking for two answers. It's a quadratic equation. It's squared. So we should have two solutions, but we only get one. And that's because it's a repeated root. Now, I'm showing you how to do these without a calculator, but you can always check yourself by graphing it and making sure that your equation either crosses or touches, in this case, it would touch the x-axis at that number. Okay, And we can see that this equation touches the x-axis at 7. It doesn't cross, it touches. And I can confirm, I can go to the table, and at x equals 7, the y value is 1. Okay? Alright. <clears throat> Let's look at number 2. Okay? Most of the time, they're not going to already be equal to 0. You're going to have to do a little bit of work to get sometimes more work than others uh, to make sure that it's equal to 0. So this equation is equal to 6. So we need to start by moving that 6 to join everything else. Okay, so I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. I already have a constant on the left side. So 14 minus 6 is positive 8. Please, please, please be careful with your signs, with your numbers, when you're moving things from side to side. If it crosses that equal sign, you have to change its sign. It was positive 6. So that means it's got to be negative 6 when we move it to the other side. Now, we're still in a pretty simple case of factoring here. 4 times 2 is 8. Uh, 2 plus 4 is 6. So this is x plus 4 and x plus 2. 
we set each of those equal to zero, bless you, and we solve them for x. Subtract four from both sides, so we get negative four. Subtract two from both sides, and we get negative two. Now, I encourage you to always, always, always check your answer. Now, besides graphing, one way that we can check our answer is to plug it back into the very original equation. So in this case, if I plug in negative 4 for x, now remember, if you plug in a negative number and it's being squared, you have to put it in parentheses like this. You've got to get parentheses in front of the negative, close the parentheses after the 4, squared, plus 6 times negative 4 plus 14, and if that is indeed an answer, this should equal 6. And it does. And I'm going to check negative 2 as well. You should always, always, always check your answers when you're solving an equation. Because you can always do it. You can always plug it back into the original. Uh, the same thing goes for if you're doing a multiple choice. And you can write it like this if you want to. You can say x equals negative 2 comma negative 4. The order that you list it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so this is two real solutions. Um, what I was saying about multiple choice tests, okay, if you're doing a multiple choice test and you're being asked to solve an equation, push, to, push comes to shove, all you have to do is plug in your answer choices. Take your answer choices, plug them back into the original equation, see if the left side equals the right side. Now, as a math teacher, do I really like that? No, because it's going to make you get the question right. Why not? Okay. So keep those things in the back of your mind. All right, so we get number three. All right, so we get number three. We have negative 48m is equal to negative 42 minus 6m squared. Now, in my personal opinion, I do not like for my quadratic term to be negative. So if my squared term is negative, I'm going to move that to the other side. So I'm going to move everything to the left side of this equation, even though it means I'm having to move two terms instead of just having to move one term. Now, if you really want to, sure, you can just move the, the negative 48m to the other side, but I like to avoid negative leading coefficients as much as possible. So I'm going to add the 6m to both sides, 6m squared, excuse me, and add the 42 to both sides. Now, I purposefully put them where I did because I want this in standard form. I want it to be quadratic, linear, constant. And that is equal to 0 because negative 42 plus 42 is 0. Negative 6m squared plus 6m squared is 0. Now, I'm going to find factor. What's the first thing that I need to do with this one that I'm factoring? GCF. Okay, GCF, because 6, 48, and 42 are all divisible by 6. So I've got m squared, 48 divided by 6 is negative 8, and 42 divided by 6 is positive 7. Not done factoring yet. I can factor that trinomial. Uh, m minus 7 and m minus 1, because negative 7 times negative 1 gives me positive 7. Negative 7 plus negative 1 gives me negative 8. It's fully factored, so now I'm going to set all my factors equal to 0. Now, I'm, I'm setting 6 equal to 0 for a reason, and I'll explain it here in a second, but right now I'm just going to do that much. Setting all my factors equal to 0. Now, I know 6 doesn't ever equal 0, but the reason why I do that is because in case your GCF has a variable in it, if it has a variable in it, then you're missing a solution if you don't do it. So if that were 6m, then 6m can equal 0 if m is 0. But in this case, 6 doesn't equal 0, so we just kind of throw that piece out. I'm just doing it for future-wise. Okay. Add 7 to get your first solution, and add 1 to get your second.